Okay, I switch messages. I can't ever get to the message I'm supposed to. I've been trying to give a message for literally a couple months now. But uh, he switched it so, because I feel that same spirit for a pa the past month. I've been feeling the spirit break into the room with that beauty realm. I remember in 1997 to 99 when Mike began to talk about the knowledge of God and the beauty realm of God, those, that language, the, the, the sea of glass, the knowledge of God. The, we've only touched the beginning of the beginning of the beginning. I mean, Revelation 19 says that Jesus has a name you do not know yet. <laughs> it says he has a name that only he himself knows. And you don't get to know it till you get a resurrected body. It's as if he goes, hey, you couldn't handle this. It'd blow you up. You have no idea who I am. I'm from everlasting to everlasting. I'm God. I am God. And there are things about me that you can't take until you get a resurrected body and are able to bear it. Your little, frail, weak, fallen body would literally melt or blow up if I let you know who I was. <laughs> You know, there's a doctrine in the church. It's called the doctrine of incomprehensibility. Say that with me. Incomprehensibility. And it, and, it, and it means this. The doctrine goes like this. God cannot be fully known in any one of his attributes. Which means for all eternity, he will be blowing your mind around even one truth. You can't exhaust the depths of God. He's the Alpha, the Omega, the, big, the beginning and the end, and everything moves and lives and has its being. Even the highest of heavens cannot contain Him, which means nothing in this created world can plumb the depths of Him completely. And I mean, you, you won't wake up, you know, uh, three trillion years from now in your resurrected body and go, oh, yeah. I'm a little bored with God. <laughs> no, a revelation, a wave of glory will break out of his throne. It will hit your resurrected body right in the chest, drive you into the ground. You will weep over mercy afresh for 10,000 years. Get up with snot coming out and tears and go, what in the Sam Hill was that? <laughs> your name Sam Hill please forgive me <laughs> what in the world was that he's going to blow your mind we've thought so little but I've been feeling that same moving of the spirit to call the next generation into fascination again I would give up sleep just to hey I know I can't plumb your depths I know according to all the saints through all the ages I can't exhaust even one of your characteristics. Though I can't know you fully because of Jesus, I can know you truly. I don't have to guess, even though I can't exhaust you. And so that makes it beautiful. You can know him truly, and now not knowing him fully becomes fascination and actually your eternal playground in God. You hear what I'm saying? You can know him truly in Jesus. He's just like his son. And yet you can't plumb the depths of him completely, which keeps you fascinated for all eternity. You know, we're fallen. We get so, it's amazing if you like somebody for more than three minutes or six months. It's amazing. Have you heard anybody come? They meet, you know, you know Susie meets uh, Lizzie and, Susie comes back and you go, hey, how was it with Lizzie? Oh, she's amazing. Oh, my gosh. She has a similar story. And Liz, I, I think Lizzie and I are going to be good friends. And six months later, you're like, hey, how are you and Lizzie doing? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> it's like an onion. Layers to dysfunction there. I could have not been so wrong about a person. I'm praying for her now, but I'm drawing boundaries. <laughs> Right? It's a miracle when anybody gets along with anybody in this fallen world. It truly is. 
It's a miracle. <laughs> and so, but, but my point is, what was my point, people? There was a really powerful point to that whole Lizzie Susie thing. What's that? Oh, you can't get bored with God. He's in it. Thank you, Bonnie. There was one person listening to the sermon. I appreciate it. And so uh, uh, God is inexhaustible, which now turns unknowing into fascination. That's the glory of it. But I've been feeling that invitation back into another generation getting lost in the knowledge of God. I've been going, Lord, you know what? My kids are raised. I can, I can give up some night's sleep now. I can throw a little fasting in there just for fun and see if you'd tell me something about yourself. And I can seek you in a new way. And I can do, hey. And if you let me do it with a few people, that would be more fun. And if not, I'll still be there. You know? So anyway, I feel that. So with Carol, when y'all were leading up there, and Chris, that's it's this, like there's this invitation into that beauty realm where we find our freedom. And he breaks us out of boredom. And he begins to entice us and move us in through fascination and love into how far will you let me go? How abandoned will you let me be? I'm excited because that means he's going to mark a new... <coughs> a new uh, round of 18-year-olds, 12-year-olds, and 20-year-olds. and Some of us old folks will get caught up in the thing as well. And so, so go ahead and open your Bibles to Revelation 4. The Lord changed. I felt like the Spirit prompted me to change and preach this. I don't know if I preach this here or not. It, it doesn't really matter. He, he said to do it. Revelation 4. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. Father, we thank you for your word. And we ask that you would match weak words with power. That you would anoint your written word and that you would, anat you would anoint the weakness of the spoken word and you would match it with your power. That you would take it, Lord, ask for a piercing of the heart by the spirit of revelation. Wound us tonight, Lord. Wound us by the spirit of revelation. Lord, wound us to want more of you. Produce hunger fascination, longing. Father, we thank you that you're like this. So send Holy Spirit, the teacher. He's the teacher. We are the students. We want to learn from him. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I want to jump into this Revelation 4 because the Revelation, the book of Revelation gives us what the Father is going to do or his plan given to Jesus to bring forth 
the full redemption of all things. It's his strategy, his plan, what he's going to do, and it's going to end in Revelation 21, 17. The Lord is going to anoint the church with both, both presence and pressure to bring us into fullness. So by the end of the book of Revelation, it says the spirit and the what? Bride say, come Lord Jesus. So this book gives us the promise that Jesus is going to bring the church into unity with the spirit about longing for Jesus' return. That's amazing. That verse, we could spend a lot of time on that verse, but that verse states that the church will be in her bridal identity. It doesn't say the spirit and the army say come. It doesn't even say the, the spirit and the body say come. It doesn't even say the spirit and the family say come. It describes the church in that verse in her bridal identity, which is in her position of her belovedness as one who receives the fiery affections of Jesus and gives them back to him. Do you see that? We're all sons of God, position, authority, and we're all the corporate bride of Christ, a, a designation of love and affection. It's not just that we serve him and have power with him. It's we're madly in love with him as we serve him and have power, share power with him. That's the glory of the gospel. That Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Trinity, who commune from everlasting in love together before God created anything, he loved himself in perfect fellowship. Love always precedes sovereignty because love was here before he made anything. Now, he is sovereign over everything, but he's sovereign, and it came out of that fellowship of love he decided to create all things, and specifically one creature made in his image to be brought in into intimacy with him in a way that no other creature would. It's a beautiful thing, but the spirit and the bride say, come. In other words, she's in her bridal identity. I love you. She's in agreement with the spirit. Hallelujah. How many of you know what a statement that is? And she's in agreement with the spirit over wanting Jesus to rule and reign over all the nations of the earth. That's an outstanding promise. But before she gets there, she's going to go through many pressures and she's going to go through receiving his presence and just the right combination of overcoming and persecution to bring her into this place of wholehearted love and agreement. It's a beautiful book. But it begins with this wonderful first verse, if you turn with me to chapter 1, because I want to give you just a little bit of the backdrop. And if we don't finish tonight, I'll, I'll finish next week. But I, the, this is a great sentence. The book begins. Now, I'm not giving you an end time uh, 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 what, what, explication where I'm going to set up charts. That's not my goal. I, I'm really going to stay within one lane called the beauty realm. God's beautiful nature and ways and who we are in light of his beauty. Although I could do the other. But in the first verse, it says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. Who's the him? Jesus. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which the Father gave Jesus. <laughs> this is amazing. To show his servants. Now what does that even mean? It means that the Father looks over at Jesus and says, Jesus, you revealed my glory in your first coming, but they have no idea really who you are. <laughs> they, they know you because of the Gospels, because you came, you died, but you came in humility, shrouded in humility and meekness, the Bible says when he comes again, he will literally shine and be the light source for the new Jerusalem. The light source for the universe will be Jesus. And you will shine like him. I mean, we, he is so, in his first coming, he was 
clothed in humility. And even now in meekness he reigns. He's at the right hand of the Father, full of power, but none of the kings of the earth know. But one day it will be openly displayed. (laughs) And he will come as the King of kings and Lord of lords. And it will be fully disclosed on that day who he is. And all the nations will worship him. And all the, all, the, all the peoples will go, it was really wisdom to give your heart to him before he came. <laughs> it's wisdom now. Like, don't wait till the light show. Like, you want the entrance ticket. You want the good seats. And so the father speaks to Jesus and goes, Jesus, it's time to reveal your second coming glory. You gave a glimpse on the Mount of Transfiguration, but I want you to give John a glimpse. Yeah, I want, I want you to give the one who leaned his head on your breast because he was just so, as the beloved disciple, he just loved you and, you know, felt so comfortable with you, comfortable enough to call himself your favorite all throughout his gospel. I mean, it's just, I want you to go to him And I want you to blow his mind with your majesty. Can you imagine that? I can almost, and John's on the island of Patmos. He's in the bottom of a mine as a slave working. He's been exiled there because of the Roman powers have tried to kill him twice. They tried to boil him in oil twice. Neither time worked. Can you imagine that, being boiled in oil? I can't think, I mean, that, that, that's terrifying. That's absolutely terrifying. I mean, if, you, if you're walking up to the oil, I mean, it's tongues all the way. Tongues, crosses, <laughs> holy water, I, that, that's terrifying. Just being deep fried, like a French fr- uh, that's terrifying. Like a, uh, like a, what is it called, those things, churros or whatever? I, I mean, that's like... <laughs> That's scary. You're praying in tongues, you're crossing, you're doing anything you can. But can you imagine once you get in the oil and you don't boil? That's awesome. I mean, on the way up, it's terrifying. But once you're in, can you imagine? Come out, John. Yeah, you come in. The water's fine. They did that to him twice. It didn't work, so it was making him a bigger, uh, uh, it was making his reputation more renowned, so they decided we'll just put the old man, exile him on an island and put him in a, in a, as a slave in the bottom of a mine working. And he's in the spirit on the Lord's day, and Jesus comes to him, and he has no idea. The one that Jesus so entrusted him that he gave his mama to. That's how close. He said, son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. He entrusts his mother to John. But on that day when Jesus shows up, he hears the voice like a trumpet and the sound of a rushing multitude of waters. And he turns around to see the voice. And when he turns, he sees what? Jesus is standing there, shining like the sun in full strength. He has a white robe with a golden sash. His eyes are like a flame of fire. His feet are like burning bronze. He has a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. His hair is white like wool. And John hits the floor like a dead man. Now three times John's going to fall down and worship, fall down like a dead man. Two times he's going to be so discombobulated he's going to worship an angel. And the angel says, stop that right now. You, uh, that's dangerous. Worship God. Don't do that to me. But he's undone three different times. He falls down. He falls down in the fetal position, undone by the beauty and glory of Jesus. And I can almost see Jesus, as it says, he reached out his right hand and said, do not be afraid, John. Now, this is great news. My glory's not here to harm you. My glory's here for your fascination. 
He said, behold, I have the keys of death and hell, John. You're going to be able to be with me forever. <laughs> oh, I tell you, and from that point, he shows John that he's the shepherd of his churches. He walks among the lampstands and promises before pressure comes, he's going to get us ready. Isn't that good news? He's going to come to his people and encourage them and exhort them and point out their issues. Beloved, he's going to get us ready for the pressure that's coming. He's a good shepherd. He's a great leader. And she may look rough now. We may look really rough now. But he's going to get us ready. He's going to help his church. So in chapters 2 and 3, he shows his commitment to his church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, Jesus said. He is, it's called the great commitment. You know, there's a great commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You, you know that one? That's a great, there's a great commission called go into the world, right? And proclaim the gospel, discipling them and everything that he said. But there's, always, there's also a great commitment. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Jesus shows in Revelation 2 and 3, he's going to get his church ready. And then in Revelation 4, before the hour of shaking, he's going to give us the picture of his father on the throne. He's going to give us a glorious picture. We affectionately call it the beauty realm. It's the place where God reveals himself in his governmental center. Are, are you all with me? you you got to talk to me. I, I, feel like I'm, I feel like I'm over in England or something. Like, yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I'll just tease it. <laughs> yes, yes. After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So before Jesus is going to reveal, before Jesus walks over in Revelation 5 and takes the scroll, which is the Father's blueprint, his plan, to bring forth redemption, heaven on earth, and to bring all the nations into the worship of God. Before he opens that scroll and looses its seals and brings it forth, he first wants to show the very, the very center of God's governance, his government, the throne room. And so you see here, a door opens. That's why this house of prayer is called Open Door House of Prayer. After these things... I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. There's a door open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, Come up here and I will show you things which must, must take place. Now what's interesting is the first voice which sounded like a trumpet, who is that? It's Jesus. We know that from chapter 1. The first voice that sounded like a trumpet. And so Jesus is the one who opens the door and the one who brings us up there. Now this is great news. From the very beginning of Revelation 4, we see that Jesus is the one, His voice opens the door and brings us up there. Which means this, Jesus is the way into the beauty realm. You know how you get into that throne? One man and what He did. There's no other way. There's no other name. There's only one name under heaven and earth by which men can be saved. It's the name of Jesus. He's the only voice that opens the door. This is good news. The Bible says by a new and living way, by his torn flesh, we enter into the Holy of Holies in the New Jerusalem. Love, this is great news. You didn't enter because of your works. You didn't go through that door because of something you did. Another man opened that door and you got in. How many of you have ever been into a green room or a VIP because of somebody else's status? It's the best feeling in the world to go into a special place where only certain people can go and you're the guest, therefore you have no protocol. You can't get in trouble. Only your guests who, who brought you in. So you can like grab all the cookies and eat everything. It's just amazing to be a guest and to a VIP. You get in there because of somebody else. 
Beloved, you got into a room because of another man's labor and qualification. He died on that cross and bore your sin. He died your death. He paid a debt you could not pay. And he opened that door for you to get in a room that you could not get into but by the blood of Jesus. That's good news tonight. <laughs> Do you know it says about heaven, if you've ever done a study on heaven, it says that cherubim with flaming swords of fire guard the 12 gates. Now those gates are big. The walls of the New Jerusalem are literally 1,500 miles high and 1,500 miles wide, and they have 12 gates, which means how big are those gates? How big is a gate to a 1,500-mile-high wall? Mount Everest is only, what, 29,000, 32,000 feet? You're about six miles from sea level, you know, you're not even out of the carpet in the New Jerusalem. <laughs> like you're, you, it's just baseboard at the top of Mount Everest. And you know, there's 12 gates, and you know what? They're made out of one pearl. There's some planet in the universe that is big enough to have an ocean to create a pearl. how do you get the pearl? Did it just snap in the pearl or did you have a planet? Kind of hope he had a planet that was big enough somewhere that could make a giant pearl that's about a thousand miles high, 500 miles wide. That would be amazing. A pearl about the size of the U.S., that would be unbelievable. But it says that cherubim guard those doors, those gates, and not one defiling thing will enter. Beloved, I, 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 tonight I have such a burden, even as I share that, for every Muslim in the world. Can you imagine? They're hoping if they do a little more good than bad, Allah will let them in. The only problem is if you're going to go through the gate, not one defiling thing. Not one. Not one. It's a perfect place. Not one, not one, not one will enter past those swords of fire. Not one. You won't make it if you're trusting in your efforts. You will make it past those cherubim. But the Bible says if you trust in Christ and trade your life for His work and His life, you enter a new and living way. You don't go through the gates with a cherubim. That whole thing about going to the gate and St. Peter's there, you don't go through the gate. If you go through the gate, you don't make it. Hebrews says you go through a new and living way called the torn flesh of Jesus. You walk by the cherubim. You give them a wink. You go through Christ. You pop up in the throne room. And when he goes through that open door, he doesn't go to the outskirts of the New Jerusalem and kind of find his GPS and make his way to the throne. No, you go right to the throne. How many of you know there's not chutes and ladders in the kingdom? I think I got in the throne, but not so shoot. Darn it, I hate that shoot. Shoot, shoot. This is big. One man... One voice, one labor, one cross, one resurrection, one ascension got you there. Period. If you're trusting in anything else, it's folly and foolishness and absurdity and the height of pride. You've not had a revelation of those cherubim and their swords of fire. But God could give you tonight a revelation of His Son who traded his life for yours so that you could pop up. How many of you love, this is, this is really what I love about Europe. They're old enough where they have castles with like secret passageways. 
How many of you always wanted to find a house with secret passageways? It's like, yeah, secret passageways. Well, there's a passageway called Christ. And you go through him and you pop up into the center of Father's governance over the universe and you're seated in heavenly places. This is amazing. This is unbelievable. Well, I tell you, not only has he given you access to God's throne, but he's given you citizenship, which means this. It's both your throne and your home. Revelation 4 is not just your throne, it's your home. Oh, I tell you, do you have a revelation of that? <laughs> oh, you see, you've been brought near and adopted into the family of the Father. A co-heir with Christ. Oh, I tell you, I, I love, don't you love him for this? Anyone? Thank you. Three people love him for that. It's powerful. Oh, we're not going to have time tonight, but I'm going I'm to do a little. We'll have, to, we'll have to follow it up next week. Well, I tell you, when John goes up there, now look what's going to happen. He says, immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. Now, this is very interesting as a Bible student. The scripture likes to describe thrones. If you go through the scripture, have you ever read of Solomon's throne? Ivory overlaid with gold, six steps, lions on each step. Massive throne. Describes it, it's ornate. And yet John goes to God's throne room, sees his throne, and doesn't give us one adjective about the throne. Not even one sentence. Nothing. You're like, what, what, did, what did God, the Father's throne, look like? He says nothing. That's very interesting. Because men, all throughout the annals in history, describe their thrones. How big their thrones, how ornate their thrones. And so the whole history is filled with big thrones and little men. And yet when John goes to heaven, he goes, it's not that he didn't see the throne, he saw the throne. But then the throne compared to the one who sat on the throne? <laughs> he goes, I didn't want to waste your time with the throne. The throne was certainly ornate. God's a serious artist. Look at the creatures around the throne. It was ornate, but John gives that, that, that wasn't the important part. And he goes immediately to God. It's not the throne. It's the one who sat on the throne. <laughs> Beloved, the only, the, the only good thing about heaven is God's there. If he ain't there, you don't want to go. It's the fact that God's there. John goes up and he goes, I saw a throne. But it was the one who sat on the throne. He got me. He's looking around and look at this. He, he goes, and, I, and one sat on the throne and he who sat there was like a jasper and sardis stone. He goes up and what's interesting about this is you've got to remember this is unbelievable. We see it so drab like 2D and grays and shadows. But this is, can you imagine going up to God's throne what that's like? We're going to find out in a minute that lightnings, thunders, voices break out from the throne. This is not like John goes up and he opens a door in heaven and he goes through. Here's Jesus goes through and goes, ah, wow, wow. Ooh, there it is. Green clovers, yellow diamond, blue star. 
That's Lucky Charms, people. That's not the throne. That's not the throne. That's not what he, but it's like he's frolicking around the throne, just kind of writing some things down. That's not how it is. When God, when God calls John up to the throne, beloved, this the throne is the one place that God makes where he can display his glory without destroying it. That's God's predicament is to dwell in a place and make it strong enough that he doesn't destroy it when he displays his power. Isaiah 6 says that even that place that he made with his hands shakes when he stirs his glory up a little bit. <laughs> it's when God in his throne begins to manifest his power. You can just Have you ever done a study? On the immediacy of God's presence, everything around God shakes. He's just shaking. Not because he's mean, because he's holy. He's holy. It's not because he's mean. He, I mean, can, can you imagine, you think you have a predicament in getting to know God? He has a much bigger predicament. How can he, who set his affections on you, who's madly in love with you, keep you alive so he can love you and be near you? You think he's just mean. You think he actually hides himself predominantly, gives you very little information, and then holds you eternally accountable for the very little information that he gives you. How could it be so cruel? God has a much bigger dilemma. It's this. How can he who loves you and made you in his image, who wants to share himself with you forever and let you rule and reign with him on his behalf, get you near him without killing and destroying the very creature he made for love. You go, how can he be that mean? He's not mean. He's just infinite. You're finite. You're weak. He's strong. His light, it says, he looked and God was like a jasper. He was like a brilliant shining light. You know the very first thing? That John the Apostle, after he had this encounter, writes in 1 John, in verse chapter 5, he says, That which I heard from the beginning, I say to you, God is light. He shines like a jasper. He's light. He's light. Oh, I tell you, he's light. You're not. That's a dilemma. And his light is not like your light. This light, you can pass your hand through it, no problem. God's light has things in it. It's inapproachable. It has things in it like humility and righteousness and glory and power and meekness. And you can't pass through it, it's inapproachable. God is light. And in him there is no darkness at all. And that is, beloved, if you understood what I was saying right now, you would be running around this building screaming your head off. God is light. Why? Why does John start the gospel? That which we heard from the beginning we tell to you, God is light. Because it's your salvation. You get out of this darkness because God is light. There's no darkness. I just want to undermine your accusation right now. If God had one speck of darkness, one malicious thought, one conniving idea, one capricious second, can you imagine the most powerful being, Thanos times a million, who could just snap his fingers and everything is gone or worse, and one second he gets a capricious idea, he turns Loki on us, and all of us are caught in the worst deceptive nightmare and horror. It's like Groundhog Day just playing out every day. It's a malicious thing and trauma and horror. No. God is light. And there's no darkness. How can impurity save us and make us pure? It can't. God is light. That's your salvation. You ought to be going home tonight going, God is light. Yeah. Well, I tell you, try this for a week. Go. Put your hand on your head and go, release light to my mind. Light to my emotions. 
light to my will. Let light shine through my body. Let my eyes be light. Let light come. Oh, do that for a week and see what happens. Fill my spirit with light. 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 <laughs> Where were we? God is light. He's like a jasper and a sort of stone in appearance. He's not just jasper, which is brilliant, translucent light. But he also shines like a jasper stone, which is red, which means God is not only light. John later is going to write his next thing is God is love. He doesn't just burn. He doesn't just shine pure light. He burns with affection towards us. Oh, that's so good news. Does, it, does church, does anybody get excited about God who's light? burns with affections towards little itty bitty me. God is love. His incandescent light burns fiery red like a sardis stone. He's ardent love. He's burning desire. Can you, out of the Fellowship of the Trinity, God's love overflows and welcomes us. I can't even imagine this. Do you know how much he loves you tonight? Have you ever just considered in one moment, Satan draws a third of the angels in rebellion against God and God does nothing? Hebrews 2 says he doesn't take on an angel's form and die an angel's death and redeem angels. And yet he made one creature in his image that is so unique and so is the object of his affections that when 100% of humanity would thumb their nose at him and rebel against him and say, no, thank you, God, God would say, uh-uh, no, uh-uh, uh-uh, no, uh-uh, you are mine. Here's how it's going to go down. Satan, do you see that woman? Do you see here? I'm going to put enmity between her and you and her seed is going to crush the head of your seed. And the ones that I made in my image are going to be mine. Why? Because I made hell for you and all your devils. Not for them. They are mine. And not long from now, I will take on their form. I will live their life. I will die their death. I will atone for them. I will shatter the power of death. I will raise them up and seat them in heavenly places right next to me. Period. The end. You're like, whoa. What just happened? He's fire. He's burning love. Oh. I used to think when I was first a believer, when I was young, that he loves me, but he doesn't like me that much. Because a God of love, that's what he has to do. I mean, if you're love, you've got to die on a cross. That's kind of the job description. He had to do it. But now that I'm in his kingdom, I'm mostly a failure, and he's mostly mad or mostly sad about my life. I had no idea of God's burning affections for me. And Jesus said this in John 15. He goes, guess what? Just as the Father loves me, I love you. And then in John 17, 23, he goes, oh, and, and by the way, just like the Father loves me and I love you, just as the Father loves me, he also loves you. I want to ask you a question. How much does the Father love Jesus? <laughs> A little bit? Like a little bit? Like more than most? Or how much does he love Jesus? Can he love Jesus any more than he does right now as the pure radiant reflection of his glory? As the full revelation of his personhood? The son of his delight? 
that when you see him, you see the Father. When you hear him, you hear the Father. When he touches you, the Father touched you. How much does he love Jesus? The same as he loves you. This is unthinkable. It's unthinkable. God is light. God is love. Oh. Church, I don't ever grow tired of that revelation. Don't ever become bored with it. Don't ever think you're beyond it. Don't ever, don't ever, don't ever, don't do it. It'll only display your immaturity. Don't do it. Just fall madly in love with the way God loves you. Be undone by it. Let it touch your heart. God is light. God is love. And it says, and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. Now this is amazing. Because he's light and because he's love, he administrates his governance with mercy. The green rainbow is it's mercy. If, aren't you glad he's not just light? If he was just light, it's beautiful, but we'd be in trouble. And he's not just affection, he's pure affection. And because he's pure affection, he administrates his governance through mercy. Isn't that good news? Tender mercy. So that we can make it. So that we can be near him. We don't have time. We don't have time. Father, I thank you. Oh, we haven't got to the main part. Yeah. Says all the people without four year olds. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I, I was just saying that. I'm seeing the mom back there go. I'm just kidding. I'm just having fun. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Then in verse 5. John's attention turns from the one who sits on the throne to all the stuff that's happening around the throne. From the very, what's interesting about this, this is unbelievable that there's sights and sounds emanating from the throne of God. What's interesting about these sights and sounds, they're not outside of him, they're coming from him. <laughs> So that when we say lightnings come from him, it's not like a, a, a cumulonimbus cloud rolls up and there's lightning going on around him that's apart from him. It's actually out of his being, lightning and thunder and voices. And that's what I said, that John's not like going up to the throne. He's kind of frolicking around, looking around. Hey, no, this is like a category five hurricane of God's glory. It's the one place where he manifests his power. And why in the world do you think that the four living creatures have hooves? Do you know why the four living creatures have hooves? How do you stand upright in a 200 mile an hour wind on glass? They take those hooves and they dig them in to the sea of glass and they wait for God to manifest. Like hold on. How many of you, what's the best roller coaster in Florida? Somebody please tell me. Velociraptor. Where's that at? Okay, Velociraptor, Universal. I'll write that down. You ever, right before you get on a ride that you're like, you're checking the seat belt, you're doing this, I'm gripping my feet around the neighbor next to me just in case mine comes off. Those living creatures, they dig in. Why? Because God breaks out. Power comes out of him. He's the origin of all power. 
He's the origin of all revelation. He's the origin of all sound and light and colors. It's breaking out of him. And beloved, John is up there in like a category five hurricane just going, oh! Now, I lived in Kansas City for 20 years. And if you've ever seen a thunderstorm come off of the plane with a bolt of lightning that looks as wide as a refrigerator and hits the ground and shakes the entire city, what in the world is it like around the throne with thunder and lightning breaking out and power? The thunder and lightning is his power. It's breaking out. The voices are the spirit of revelation. Can you picture it? It's his governance. Not only does he rule through power, he rules through his word. It goes forth. His voices. How many of you have heard preaching and all of a sudden the spirit of revelation comes on you and like you're caught up and you're chasing a bunny down a bunny trail that the preacher's not even thinking about? That's called the spirit. It's voices. A voice just came right from the throne. Just took you on a little journey. How does the God of all things hear everything and speak to everyone at the same time? Voices. I remember Mike would preach and, and, and he was going to be preaching on a simple theme and I would go that night and he'd go, no, you need to go home. You've heard this message literally 40 times. And I go, oh, I'm not here to listen to your message. I'm here because when you preach, the spirit of revelation comes in the room and I'm going to be studying a scripture I don't understand. So that as you're preaching and that spirit of revelation opens up, I'm going to get insight on Daniel chapter 7 tonight. Thank you. <laughs> There's one verse that I've been just knocking my head. I, I got to get that verse. And, and he goes, oh, and so I would stay in about halfway during the sermon. Boom! <laughs> I'd get up and go, and walk out. <laughs> I picture that like voices. It's the, he's speaking all the time. He, out of his being, he just speaks. He's always talking. He's always speaking by the Spirit. Power and his voice. Oh, beloved, here's why I'm saying this thing. We don't believe he's real. He's the living God. We actually think he's a concept or an idea or construct that we can figure out the rules and manipulate and work around. Oh, no, he is. Oh, uh, 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 uh. He is raw power and light and thunder and lightning and voices and colors. He is a category five storm that, thank God, you and your design was made for. You're the one creature made for that and you think your life doesn't amount to anything you just think you grew up got married and had kids and life no you were made for the storm of God's glory the thunderings breaking out any moment the God of glory can take your monotonous boring life and break out of you any moment any moment do you know who you are do you know who you're made in the image of your whole life is to be a rumbling and voices and breakouts of power. Your whole life is to be filled with color so that when you get anywhere, somebody goes, something changed. Somebody was here different. It's like you stepped out of eternity and just walked into a dry, flat, sinful place and all of a sudden, God begins to rumble. We become over familiar with phrases like God's throne, heaven. Why do we want to get why do we want to get unfamiliar with it? Why do we want to relearn it? Not, not, not because God's mean and hiding stuff from us. It's because there's more to be had. 
go on, sweet. Settled for the kiddie pool of revelation, my good friend says, Corey Russell. The kiddie pool of revelation. We need to get back to that sea of glass, that ocean of the knowledge of God. I'll end it with this. I remember one prophetic gentleman said he had an encounter with Jesus and he was standing by the ocean, by the beach. And Jesus picked up these granules. Oh, oh no, first, oh, they were shining like blue. That's what it was. And he, and he looked out and Jesus looked at all the granules of sand. And he said, this is the beginning of 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 the knowledge of God. And then he picked up a handful of those granules and went, and this is what is available in this life. That, that messed with my mind. I went, oh, I'm so stuck here in the now. I forget this is but the internship of eternity. I'm in the internship. I'm going to get married, be faithful, and love my wife and raise my kids in godliness and reflect his glory. Why? It's the internship. <laughs> but it's hard. Yeah, but it's just the internship. You're going to graduate in the next stage to the full-time job of ruling and reigning with that category five hurricane called God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in his likeness. You know what it says when we come on that day? It says we don't know what he's going to look like which means John just got a little foretaste. But however he looks, 1 John chapter 3 says, we will be just like him. What? Do you know who you are? And in this internship, we just feel weak and powerless and fickle and fallen. But oh, beloved, you don't know who you are. You have treasure in those earthen vessels. You have no idea where this ends. Next week, this one's about God. Next week is about us. Do you have any idea who you are? But for this week, God is enough. God is enough. I think tonight, that spirit, I just want to honor that when I say that spirit came in the room, I don't mean a different spirit. I mean, when it, how many of you have read in the Bible, it says the spirit of adoption, the spirit of holiness, the spirit of truth. That's not different spirits. That is de describing an administration of the Holy Spirit, a ministry of the Spirit. It's one Holy Spirit. <laughs> but he comes with the spirit of adoption. He comes with the spirit of truth. He comes with the spirit of conviction. You hear what I'm saying? When I say that spirit, I mean the Holy Spirit came in the room and I could just feel that invitation to the knowledge of God. How much more will you give me? How abandoned will you let me be, God? Would you mark my heart with fascination for who you are? Would you restore hunger for me again? Oh, would you begin to fascinate my heart? I'm over familiar with phrases. Oh, just shoot the phrase in the head, God. Just take me in more. Show me. Oh, I want to see you. You know what's the beautiful thing? It says when Jesus comes, we're going to be just like him. And those who have the hope of looking just like him are pure. You mean if I just have the hope, I'm going to shine like he shines? I'm pure? Oh, yeah. You don't know the power of a gaze, of an attention set upon him. If you're here tonight, you know, I, I dip my toe in the knowledge of God. I kind of dip my toe. I read a few systematic theologies, and I read the Bible a little bit, and did that online class, and had four live webinars, and Da, da, da. I dip my toe in, but you go, you know what? I, I want God to anoint me afresh. I want to go on a journey in the word of God where he blows my mind. He blows my mind. Where he breaks off levels of unbelief and 
what you, what they call, you know, pragmatic atheism. We say we believe in God, but practically we're atheists. If that's you, you go, you know, I want to answer that invitation. I think there's more. I think God could blow my mind. I, I'm asking God right now, hey, what about opening this place up for for some hours, just reading the Bible together. Do you know out of that room, of that bridal prayer watch, came some of the most gifted teachers that I've ever met in, in the world. They just sat there in their boredom and dull hearts and forced themselves to expand, to get more. That's you. You go, you know what? I want the spirit of revelation resting on my life. I want to be fascinated by God. You might have even grown up in the 90s and heard the fascination with God language or 2000. But it got old. It didn't really stick. It, it was just language. But you, I want the reality of being fascinated. I want my heart alive in the Spirit. I want a radiant heart. I want my eyes bright. I want something to gain my attention that's not of this world. Something that's so superior that it makes every other pleasure in this life seems so small. That's you. I want you to just stand up. I, I'm just going to ask us to respond bodily to the Lord. Let's just stand up. Let's, it helps me sometime. It, it may not help you. You do what you want. There's no religious control or abuse here. We, you do what you want. You get comfortable with God and His family. Sometimes it helps me to take a stand where it says Daniel set his heart there's a setting of the heart where we go, you know what? I'm not going to live on just a, a measly portion. I want all that God has for me. Not striving. I want to rest in my sonship. And I want to reach from that place. I want to rest in what he's done for me. Only one voice and one man opened that door. I didn't get in it by any other way. But now I'm in. I want to see him. I don't want to wait till I see him face to face. I want to know him now. I want to love him now. I remember John Owen said, if you don't love him now, what makes you think you're going to love him then? I want to love him now. I want to see him now. Even a dim glimpse, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, 17 and 18, a dim glimpse, a dim glimpse of Jesus will transform you from one degree of glory to another. A dim glimpse, just a little glimpse. Isn't that great? Just a little morsel of revelation is enough to transform you from one degree of glory to another. want to know you, God. Oh, we want to love you. Wound my heart again, God. Pierce me till I want you. Isaiah said, I was destroyed by revelation. Woe is me, I'm undone. That in Hebrew means I'm ruined. I've seen the king high lifted up. Oh God, I want to be destroyed by revelation. Ruined. Undone. Laid bare. Just a heap of snot and tears. So you can make me like you. So I can love like you. Think like you. Live like you. Rule like you rule. Forgive like you forgive. Come, Holy Spirit. Touch my weak heart. Some of you are going, the lie of the enemy comes and says, you know what? You don't even hunger for God. You don't even hunger for God. And yet, inside your heart, you go, you know what? I, I don't think I'm that hungry for God or His knowledge, but I want to be. And the evil one comes and says, that's not good enough. No. God's the one that even puts it in your heart to want to hunger. That's Him. 
Some of you might go, I'm not hungry, but God, I want to. Help me. That's enough. God will take that and match it. Just talk to him tonight. Say, touch me with the spirit of revelation. Touch me. To know who you are and who I am. What's available in this life and the next. Just lead us, Carol. I remember Mike Bickle in 1997. He preached on the knowledge of God in the municipal auditorium. I was at the top row of the stadium, of the, of the auditorium. And he just kept saying it. He goes, this generation, it's, you know, we have very few voices. We have lots of echoes, just people regurgitating one-liners. Slick preachers, just one-liners and slick sermons. He goes, but John the Baptist said, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. An echo disseminates information. A voice is pierced and turns the hearts of people. And I remember hearing that he invited us into the ocean of the knowledge of God. And I, I couldn't take it halfway during the sermon. I just went forward and sat at the front and go, God, i got to have you. And here I am. I, I go, you know what, 20 some years later, it works. I'm as undone by him today at 53 as I was at 28. If you go, I want to set my heart. I, I want God to, I just want to make a declaration that I want him. You're free to stay where you're at or you can come forward. I'd like to pray for you. As Carol goes into the song, I want to. Come and open up my eyes. Touch my eyes. Open up my eyes. Give me the spirit of revelation. Mark me. Open up my eyes. Come to me. Come to me. Bring me through.
feel like there's some here that you you know what I when I read the Bible it's like there's a fog on it I don't have a hard time understanding it and I, I want to be able to read the Bible and know it if that's you just raise your hand right where you're at if that's you no there's no shame everybody's hand head down eyes closed just raise your hand I want to pray for you Luke chapter 24 45 it says Jesus opened up their understanding to comprehend all the scriptures Father I ask you for my brothers and sisters right now that you would open up their understanding to comprehend the scriptures that you would lift that fog off the word of God and that you would speak to them in the word and that you would reveal yourself to them in the word that they would know you in the word and they would find you there and love you there and it would be a sweet offering to you release divine understanding the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the name of Jesus seen in the kingdom the rarest thing is an 80 or 90 year old man or woman who's fascinated with God who's is in love with him and is blown away their last days as they were the first days I just felt like there was an invitation for the Lord to move certain hearts to go you know what I want to the day to my last breath I want to be undone by you you know it says George Whitfield he right before he died he was walking up stair, the stairs to go to bed and he had a brand new candle and he got halfway up the stairs and there was a window looking outside and people had gathered and he opened the window because they had all gathered they knew he was in his last days of his life he opened the window and he began to preach and for the next two or three hours he just preached and was as fascinated as if the first day then he went climbed it burnt out and he knew it was time to end this is a couple hours he went to bed and he fell asleep and says that Similarly, uh, John Fletcher, which was John Wesley's right-hand man, he preached a sermon on visiting the sick. 
and I guess tuberculosis and was wiping out whole populations. It was either tuberculosis or smallpox. I can't, I can't remember which one it was. And he gave a sermon that Christians have to go visit them whether they lose their life or not. And so he lived what he preached and he caught it and he was dying. And it says even on his death that he was so happy. And so when it took him where he couldn't even sing anymore, he would sing. And so he told his wife, he goes, hey, my top three songs, I think it was his top five songs. When I can no longer sing out loud, I'm going to hold up a finger. And one is this song. Two is this song. Three is this song. Four is this Five. And it says, as he was on his deathbed, he's laying there and he would go. And he would smile and drop his hand and three. And his wife would begin to sing it. And it says, even on his deathbed, he was like a little child singing to the Lord. I, I just had this invitation. Could we love him as much in our old age as we do in our youth when the truths are known? Would we be as fascinated by it? That's you. You go, hey, hey, I want that. I think that's a good goal. I want to grow really old with Jesus. Fascinated by him. I want my grandchildren to go, you know, my 50 grandchildren running around. My daughter-in-law's back there. That's why I'm just kidding. She's like, you don't have to have the 50, just 30. The other two will fill in the gaps. And, uh, I want, him, I want him running around going, hey, have you seen Grandpa? He's crazy. He's always sitting in that chair just praying and staring and telling the craziest story. If that's you, I just felt like that invitation. Just talk to the Lord right now and say, I want to be as on fire and fascinated at 90 as I was when I was 18 and first heard the gospel. Wouldn't that be a gift to him? That you could actually still be madly in love with him. So, Father, I just, if that's you, just right where you're at, put your hand on your heart if you want to. Just put your hand on it. Lord, give us that gift, that exquisite reach and love and fascination all our days. All our days to love you. All our days, Lord. Mark us with that spirit of revelation. Oh, Lord, let it be contagious in and around us. Give us songs and poems. Can I tell you one last, can I tell you one last story? And then I'll have to release you because the children's workers will be upset. But no, they won't, but, they, but they'll say something too. And so uh, it, uh, I was with Reinhard Bonnke having breakfast. He had just preached the night before to our one thing gathering of 20-some thousand young people there. And so I, I was so excited to eat with Reinhard Bonnke, the man who has led more people to Jesus than probably any other man in history of the faith. I, I, I mean, you can make a good case Paul did with just his writings, but I mean, just but as far as an evangelist, at one time led over a million people to the Lord in one altar call. And he had given over his ministry to Daniel and just given it over. And so I was wondering, oh, what's he doing? Like, did he move here and he's going to lead like whole evangelistic crusades throughout America and America's going to be saved and this and that and that. And I couldn't wait. And I was just like, you know, sitting there. And, and uh, so uh, some person around the table goes, Reinhardt, what are you doing these days? He goes, oh, you won't believe it. I got a direct assignment from the Lord. I'm like, oh, yeah, direct assignment. He said, I had a dream where the Lord came to me and he gave me a pen and he told me to write poetry. I'm just sitting there and I'm like a young evangelist. Like, I said, I wasn't that young at the time, but I was just, in my mind I was a young evangelist. And, and he goes, uh, he goes, um, yeah, every morning I get up really early, like at 4 a.m., and I read one chapter in, a gospel, in the gospel and I pray over it and I sing over it and I repeat it and I read it and I do that and then I write one poem that morning 
from that one chapter. I write it and then my wife wakes up. I read it to her. We talk about it. And then we pray it together and pray for our family. And then that's what I do every day. All year long. He goes, and this was breakfast at like 7 o'clock. He'd preach to like, like 11 that following night. And he goes, do you want to hear my poem from this morning? He pulls it out in this sheet of paper with this chicken scratch pencil. And he read it. <clears throat> it. It was gosh awful. It was terrible. I just want to be honest. It was one of the worst poems I've ever heard in my entire life. <laughs> Rhyme and meter had no place in his poetry. But you know what? He was like, I love this assignment. He goes, I love him. And he starts weeping. And I go, that's it. That's what I want to be like. He would meet the Lord before that year was up. And Jesus saved the best wine for last, for Reinhardt. And I thought, I want to be that old, that in love. Whether I'm leading an altar call of a million people, or whether I'm writing him one poem, poem that morning, I'm madly in love with him. That's what I want. Lord, I ask you for that quality of heart. Give it to us. Not religious, not striving, just give us that love, that reach. Oh, you have done so much for us. We love you. We bless you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. If you have children. Run over there and go get them real quick. Bless you.